Good morning. My name is Mike Smith, Technical Director for the ECA. Uh, I hope you've all had a good Easter and welcome to the ECA's Technical Tuesday. This is one of a short series of technical talks on a variety of topics of interest to the members. Uh, we have been producing a number of webinars since the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, in particular um, covering employment and contract issues, as you might imagine. However, we thought now um, during the crisis, it's probably a good time to think about brushing up on some learning or think about new technology for when we can all get back up and running, back to work properly. Uh, hey, let's get the economy going again. So uh, today is our first topic um, and it's EV or electrical vehicle charging. It's presented by Luke Osborne, part of the in-house technical team. In the background, um, as presenters, we've also got uh, Gary and myself. Uh, so if there are any questions during the presentation, then please use the uh, Q&A chat facility. Uh, put your questions on there. We'll try and answer some of them during the presentation or we'll pick up during um, a five minutes uh, Q&A at the end uh, of the presentation. So it's only a short uh, presentation, 15, 20 minutes, and I'll hand you across to Luke when you're ready, Luke. Hi, thanks, Mike. Uh, as as Mike's just said, uh, I'm Luke Osborne. I'm the Energy and Emerging Technology Solutions Advisor for ECA, and this is a brief presentation on electric vehicles and Amendment 1. Um, so we're going to be looking at uh, a brief introduction to electric vehicles, uh, why there's been an amendment so soon, uh, what are the main changes, what does this change, and so what now? What uh, What does this mean for the future? So electric vehicles in brief. Um, we're in a very changing world, uh, none more so than at this current moment in time. Uh, but post COVID, life will begin to normalise and part of that normalisation needs to be ensuring that life doesn't just go back to normal. Uh, by that, of course, I refer to getting back to the business of decarbonising our society and our practices and reaching our government's legally binding commitment of net zero carbon by 2050. At a European level, in the last week, 13 countries have signed up to agreeing that the EU Commission starts working on a recovery plan with the green transition and digital transformation at its heart. Luckily for you and your companies, electrification is a key part of the puzzle. So electric vehicles. Um, we're still in the early adopter phase, but we are seeing exponential increase in the adoption of electric vehicles. Um, 2019 saw the biggest growth in EV ownership. Um, in 2014, the registrations of electric vehicles was only 500 per month. This figure now exceeds 5,000. And this is due to the barriers of adoption now being addressed. So this was charging, how, when and where, the cost of vehicles and the cost of, uh, the cost of travel per mile, the choice of vehicles and also the performance of electric vehicles. Uh, so the Society of Vehicle Manufacturers reported uh, in February this year that there's already 135 types of electric vehicle available. There's 200 and, uh, 273 and a half thousand registered electric cars now available on the roads, uh, now actually on the roads. Uh, there's nearly 9,000 registered electric vans uh, in use and there's over 30,000 electric vehicle charge points. There's a number of things driving this adoption. Uh, we have the electric vehicle charge point incentives. There's the workplace charging scheme. This gives uh, a grant of up to of, of 75% of the installation up to £350 per charge point. And importantly for the commercial uh, businesses, this can be used for 40 charge points. So not £350 to cover 40 charge points, but 40 iterations of that. So that's a, that's a considerable sum that is available towards the adoption of this technology. Uh, there's also for the home user, the electric vehicle home charge scheme. Uh, and again, the same grant applies um, up to £350 per charge point. Incidentally, it used to be £500. This has been um, reduced gradually over time. But it is important to remember that this £350 does include the VAT element. Uh, so when you're doing your costings for electric vehicle charge point installations, do take that into account. We have had a few people um, not realise that and obviously uh, that then affected their profit margins on the back of that. There's also 
the benefit in kind. Uh, from April this year, uh, this is now as low as 0%, uh, increasing to 1% next year and 2% the year after. This offers a considerable saving for the company car user. Uh, and the, the reason behind this is to entice uh, fleet operators and, uh, and uh, companies to begin to use this scheme to adopt electric vehicles so that in two, three years time when the vehicles come up for renewal, then there's a lot of electric vehicles then entering the second hand market, which then makes it a bit more affordable for all. There is, however, a bit of an elephant in the room uh, with the OLEV scheme. We have been informed of uh, significant payment delays, um, OLEV refusing submissions for non-existent or minor errors. Um, but OLEV have told us that they are aware of the issue and that they're working to improve things. So we do hope this is going to be addressed going forward. Uh, obviously, they have a few other things uh, going on at the government level at the moment. Uh, but we are collating feedback from members that have experienced these issues. So if you have had that, please do let us know at energysolutions at eca.co.uk. There's also further legislative drivers. Um, there's the uh, UK's adoption of the Energy Performance Building Directive. This was a European directive from 2018, which, uh, which the UK has to uh, take on board as we were members. Um, this is going to be incorporated into the future home standard uh, and in part of the building regs part L. What we do know is there's going to be mandating of charge points for new builds and also for existing buildings undergoing extensive renovations. There's also the government's ban on new ICE vehicles, that's internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, this has been set at 2040, it's likely to be 2035, and there is talk that is going to be earlier still. So we could be looking at a 2030 date for that. Um, there's also a number of disruptive technologies that are likely to, to come in. This won't be a straightforward linear move from ICE vehicles to NICE electric vehicles. There will also be innovations and policies driving adoption to the public transport sector and a general reduction in typical car ownership. Um, the current global ro uh, rollout of contact tracking applications that are happening at the moment could, al could also lead to different taxation models in the future. So back to Amendment 1. Uh, this solely relates to Section 722, which uh, pertains to electric vehicles. Uh, it will allow for advances in electric vehicle charging technologies, which weren't available before. It will give it now gives new options for the electrical contractor to, de to deploy electric vehicle charge points. And importantly, it's free to view and uh, free to save electronically, but it will cost five pounds if you want to download and print it. So. There were existing options available to the electrical contractor for installing electric vehicle charging equipment. Um, the first um, was the adoption of a protective measure which didn't currently exist. Uh, this was in indent three of 722.411.4.1. Uh, this was the fabled unicorn device, uh, often sought, uh, never found. Uh, it operates by uh, mon monitoring the voltage between the CPC and Earth and activating if that exceeded 50, uh, 70 volts. It does require uh, an earth reference electrode uh, in order to take these readings. There's also the option of using an isolation transformer for electrical separation. Um, a great solution, um, but very expensive, uh, heavy and cumbersome. And so that would uh, there would need to be uh, considerations as to where these would be mounted, as obviously it's additional in size and significant mass. Uh, and also there's uh, there was the option of using a TT system and there's potential issues behind that, which we all see now. So uh, not 
the easiest of option to use, um, but it is then nonetheless. Uh, but it is an onerous operation. Um, there's also insurance limitations to consider, uh, often for the electrical contractor, unless specified in your insurance, the uh, groundworks could be limited to one meter's depth. <clears throat> but uh, crucially, uh, it's potentially dangerous due to unmapped underground services. Luckily, through Amendment 1, this is no longer required. Uh, so why is this? Well, the new option is in indent 4 of 722.411.4.1. And this, uh, this allows protection against electric shock for a single phase installation by a single device, which essentially monitors the nominal voltage, uh, ensuring that it doesn't go outside of plus or minus 10% of the nominal voltage. Um, and this has to operate within five seconds. Um, so it will disconnect all the live conduction all the live conductors from the supply and also protective earth and that's if the voltage between the live and the neutral goes above 253 volts or below 207 volts rms obviously this uh, this is likely to be incorporated into most uh, electric vehicle charging equipment going forward um it can uh, it can automatically reset. Uh, so if there was a single occurrence uh, um, of the fluctuation, the voltage, you don't really want this tripping out then the vehicle user to come out um, when they're ready for their vehicle to find that it hasn't been charged. So it can be automatically closed or reset once the voltage comes back within the, uh, the permitted range. Uh, so importantly, this then means that no groundworks are required. Uh, there was also a change to the original indent 3, which was the unicorn device I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> this now is, is cited to specifically protect against a broken pen conductor. Uh, like I said, this, uh, this is monitoring the difference between the CPC and the earth, ensuring that it doesn't exceed 70 volts RMS. Um, but as mentioned, this does use an earth uh, reference electrode. But it could also, and this wasn't in the in the previous iteration of the wiring regulations, it could also um, take this reference through a point derived from the line conductors of a three phase system. And this is detailed in Annex 722.4. Luckily for, um, for the JPL groups, there is also uh, an indent five, a future proof reg regulation, uh, which essentially allows for new devices to be developed, uh, which satisfy the safety criteria that's within amendment one without requiring a change in the wiring regulations. So this is to allow uh, advances in technology uh, to come through and to be able to be implemented uh, legally uh, without um, without needing any further changes to the regulations. There's a couple of additional changes. Um, 722.311, uh, this was uh, this pertains to maximum demand and diversity. Uh, it's quite important to note that the reference to diversity has been removed apart from in that title. Um, but this now puts an emphasis on smart technologies and capabilities allowing for load control, etc., to be utilized and factored into the design. Load control could be the ability of, a ch of charging equipment with multiple charging points, being able to split the load across the number of vehicles attached, uh, through to monitoring the building's energy load and varying the charge to the electric vehicles to be able to maximize the availability, um, the available energy uh, without exceeding the maximum supply available to the building. Uh, time of use tariffs can also be employed in smart charging equipment as well, and we'll see um, a range of these coming to market soon. There's a couple of minor amendments uh, for public areas and car park sites. Um, the protection against mechanical damage has been up to level to high severity AG3. You may see if you have uh, downloaded the amendment one, um, it does actually state medium severity AG3, but that's a, a misprint and that will be addressed in the corrigendum. Um, and the protection against a mechanical impact of I, uh, has been up to IK08 as well. Uh, additional changes as well regarding RCDs. Um, the, uh, it was um, previously 722.4. 531.2.101. It's now changed to uh, what you can see on your screen there, and it's been rewritten for clarity. Um, it does also state that except where provided by the charging equipment, protection against DC fault currents uh, shall be provided by type B RCD or a type A or type F in conjunction with a RDC DD. 
So what the hell is a RDCDD? Essentially, it's for permanently connected AC EV charging station. So these are your mode threes, which are likely to be putting on people's houses and commercial buildings. And the purpose is to remove or initiate the removal uh, of the supply to the electric vehicle in cases where a smooth residual direct current equal to or above six milliamps is detected. This can be incorporated as part of the electric vehicle charging equipment. Uh, type Fs uh, weren't previously cited in the previous regulations, they are now. Um, they're typically more expensive and rarer than Type Bs, but they're now becoming more available. Um, type F RC RCDs, uh, some vehicle manufacturers do specify them, uh, so do check with your clients on the type of vehicle that that will be used, uh, that they're intending to use. Um, and the reason for Type Fs is with more and more DC componentry and frequency controllers being installed in commercial and domestic buildings, um, Type Fs are required to, to remove any uh, any of the, the, the DC uh, fault currents that, that can, uh, can be presented. Uh, a common thing that uh, is now appearing is a modern day washing machine utilizes a frequency con uh, inverter to control a three a three phase motor, um, which then in turn can put noise back on the system. Um, there's another additional change. Uh, the um, there's been a tidying up of the formula to reflect uh, a standard torque formula more, as you can see on your screen uh, from Annex A722. Um, this was uh, this is for the neutral current of a three phase installation. Uh, you may note on the bottom there um, the L3 at the end. Uh, I've circled that there. If, if you've downloaded Amendment 1, uh, that L3 is missing from that equation. Uh, so the equation actually didn't make much sense without that. Uh, that again will be amended in the, in the corrigendum coming through. Um, so yeah, it, it makes the, the equation a lot easier to understand. Uh, additional information, uh, previous DNO notification. Um, all DNOs have their own spe specification essentially. So it's worth checking with the DNOs, but the previous practice was if the installation of the electric vehicle charge point was uh, less than seven kilowatts, um, you could install and notify the DNO within 28 days. Um, and if it was above that, prior approval was needed. Um, oh, sorry, I've just skipped back. Uh, the new guidance from the code of practice, the new IT code of practice, which came out recently, says that if the, the maximum demand of the property is less than 13.8 kVA, so essentially 60 amps, uh, then uh, you can notify the you can install and then notify the DNO within 28 days. And if the maximum demand of the property is above that, so greater than 13.8 kVA, or if there's an issue with the adequacy or the supply of existing service equipment, uh, you do need to contact the DNO first. To be honest, in many instances, the seven uh, kilowatt rule will still apply, but when heat pumps or other high rated equipment is in the installation, do be careful with the 13.8 kVA rule. So what does this all mean? Well, going forward, electric vehicle charge point installations can be a lot simpler. Uh, there is no specific need for TT installations or worrying about underground services or the differing earthing systems and, and ground rods affecting zones of influence um, because the, the new regulation now permits this, this device that monitors the plus or minus 10%. Uh, new technologies can now come in without the need for altering regulations as long as they satisfy the safety criteria uh, and the original regulations still apply for three phase so making sure the balance is within 70 volts RMS per phase and EV infrastructure will play a key part of the electrical uh, contracting works going forward. So there's um, a couple of things I'll point out. We uh, we have a new guidance note um, which will appear on a website in the next few days uh, pertaining to electric vehicle uh, charge point installations. Uh, the IET on the first of this month released the fourth edition of the electric vehicle charging equipment installation. Uh, this is a really good, uh, really good publication. If you currently if you are currently installing electric vehicle charge points or you're thinking of uh, installing these in the future, I do urge you to, to get a copy of this either digitally or, or physically. Um, it's uh, yeah, it, it, it covers a lot of uh, lot, lot of information there and gives a lot of guidance in many situations. And we do also have a guidance piece on navigating the uh, process of registration with OLED, which uh, 
isn't the easiest thing to to navigate uh, but once you're in the system it's it's fine um, also to point out on that uh, OLED funding requires uh, EV training so the uh, the electrician uh, the electrical contractor does have to have a form of EV training so this can either be by search or or at city and guilds 2919 but also importantly they need to have a manufacturer's training as well and this is for each type of electric vehicle charging point charging equipment uh, type that will be installed if you don't have those OLEV will throw back your application um, and so, yeah, we shall now uh, look at any Q&A, uh, any questions that uh, that you've put forward to us, uh, we shall try and answer. Um, we were quite limited for time on this presentation. Um, and if you want to see a, a more in depth uh, presentation, which includes vehicle to grid connections, uh, connection uh, charge types, etc., uh, there is a more in depth presentation through that address that you can see on your screen. Maybe take a photo of that address, screenshot it, um, and hopefully this will be included in uh, further um, emails out to you guys. So I shall now uh, see what questions we have got and open up to the rest of the technical team. Thank you very much for listening. OK, thank you, Luke. Um, hopefully everybody found that interesting. I think there might have been a slight sound issue at, 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 for some people at one point. Um, Gary, did you manage to sort of see where whereabouts that was? Is it worth going over anything? Good morning, everybody. Um, I think there was a slight sound problem towards the start, but the feedback is a bit different, so it depends on where people were. But if anyone does have any questions or missed anything, the webinar will be available uh, to download after the event. OK, thank you. Um, there are, most of the questions have really been about um, a, couple of, a couple of technical issues. Uh, hopefully we'll um, we'll get those sorted out for future ones. So um, at that point, if there are no other questions uh, burning, then I'll say we'll finish there. Um, thank you all for giving up your time. Um, I do hope you found it worthwhile. Um, today was the first, so uh, it's the guinea pig one. Um, hopefully it will get slicker. And, um, as Luke's already said, if there are any questions about this, um, if you want any more information around COVID-19 um, on sort of employment, technical issues, commercial issues, then please, please go to the website. Um, so I hope you all, uh, will all join us next Tuesday for another Technical Tuesday. And uh, please, in the meantime, stay safe and, and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.